Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. And today we're going to take a look. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion on um, muscles. So, anybody have any questions at this point? Okay. And let us go into PowerPoint. Okay. Where we stopped the other day, we had just taken a look at um, a structure known as the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the contractile unit of all skeletal muscle. And it consists, it's a structure, it's a very unique structure made of overlapping bands of contractile protein, both what we call thick filaments and thin filaments. And every myofibril is made up of repeating sections of these sarcomeres. So remember the myofibrils are these rods that run through the length of the muscle cell. So there are thousands of these myofibrils that run the, in, that, that, that run the length of, of the cell. So however long the cell is, it's gonna be packed full of thousands of these myofibrils. This is the myofibril. Within the myofibril, you're gonna get the light and dark bands that make skeletal muscle look striated, it's like it has stripes. The light and dark bands are the presence of what we call the thin filaments and the thick filaments. And the arrangement of these in the myofibril forms these individual sarcomeres. The sarcomeres are the, the contracting unit. It has, a, the, the sarcomere consists of a light band, a dark band, and a light band. And the light band is called the I band. There's an I band at each end of a sarcomere. And half of the light band belongs to, if we have a sarcomere here in the middle, like right here, this is this area here called the A band is the dark band. It's mostly thick filaments. The I band is all thin filaments. And the I band is shared with the sarcomere to the right and the sarcomere to the left. So every sarcomere is bounded by a, uh, an area of light band, but it's sharing that light band with the adjacent sarcomere. So, so now the uh, myofibrils are made up of, and this is where it can get confusing, are made up of myofilaments. Remember, so we, <clears throat> just to confuse you, we have fibers, which are the muscle cells. We couldn't just call them muscle cells, we have to call them muscle fibers. Then we have the myofibrils that make up the fibers. And then we have the, the myofilaments, which make up the myofibrils. The myofilaments are just the contractile protein, the actins and the myosins, the filaments here. The myosin is the thick filament. Myosin is made up of uh, the myosin protein, each molecule consists of, uh, of two proteins wrapped around each other. And they have a double head and they have a very thick tail. And the, um, the heads, if you play golf, the heads look like the heads of drivers. And you can see a thick filament consists of about 300 of these myosin molecules. So you look above the, 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 the illustration up here where all the heads are sticking out. That's a typical myosin thick filament in uh, a sarcomere with all these heads that are, that are sticking out here. Now what's important about these myosin heads is they have what are called actin binding sites on them. They also have ATP binding sites on them. The actin binding sites are going to do exactly what it sounds like. They're going to bind to the actin. Now, the, the dark band of the sarcomeres is going to be nothing but, or, or mostly myosin. These are thick filaments. The thin filaments are arrayed on top of the uh, myosins. And the thin filaments are much, much thinner. They're made of the protein actin. actin the other contractile protein, you may remember, unlikely, but you may remember 
that actin is what uh, the cells use for cytokinesis to squeeze their cytoplasm into two separate daughter cells. Actin has three parts to it. It has the thin film actually has three parts. So it. it has the actin in a double helix arrangement, the, the blueberry look, looking structures there. Then there's another protein called tropomyosin that's woven through the actin. The tropomyosin is designed to block the binding sites. The binding sites on the actin are where the myosin will attach to them. When we want to have a muscle contraction, the myosin heads will grab onto the actin. But normally they can't because the tropomyosin is woven through the actin and it blocks the binding sites. Now there is a key to unlock that and it's called troponin. Troponin is a, is a second protein in here. And troponin will, if troponin rolls over, it will drag the tropomyosin with it and allow the myosin heads to reach up and grab onto the actin. If the, the uh, tropomyosin rolls out of the way. So we have binding sites on the actin, we have binding sites on the myosin. We want to form something called a cross bridge where the actin and the myosin come together. Yeah. So those are the two key myofilaments in our, in our muscle cell. Every muscle cell, every skeletal muscle cell is packed full of billion, <coughs> billions. Uh, I got all choked up on that. Of uh, billions of actins and myosins. Every myofibril that runs the whole length of the muscle cell, I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. Uh, every muscle cell was packed full of myofibrils is going to have the going to be organized into these sarcomeres made of light and dark bands, where the light bands are the actins and the dark bands are the myosins. As there's some other filaments in here in uh, sarcomere. We have what is known as uh, titan. Titan is an elastic filament. It's in the myosin. It keeps the myosin from being stretched too far and being unable to, to uh, uh, return to its normal shape. So it will, it, it's, a, it's an anti-stretching device. We, we, the, the, the myosin stretches and then it contracts. It's elastic, it's a type of elastic uh, uh, filament. The other filament here is really, really important to us. It's called dystrophin. And this is found in the actin. And this attaches the actin to the cell membrane. So when the actin moves, so does the, the entire cell membrane of the muscle cell. Because the muscle cell will contract to its fullest extent every time it's stimulated. There's no such thing as a partial contraction of a muscle cell. We will have complete contraction of that cell and that includes the, the cell membrane has to come along with the sarcomeres. So the actin is attached, not only is, a, is directly attached to the cell membrane. So when the actins move, the cell membrane comes along here and it also keeps the, the entire uh, uh, sarco, keeps the sarcomere lined up. So it isn't you know, crooked off center or anything like that. Now there's a problem here. Dystrophin, if, that, if dystrophin is missing, then we have a condition known as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. There are a variety of muscular dystrophies, but Duchenne's is the most common uh, and the most well known. It is a sex linked recessive disorder, it means it's, it's passed on through the X chromosome. It only shows, it generally shows up. Uh, almost completely in males. You know, in males only. It's passed on from the mother, the maternal chromosome, the X chromosome that the mother contributes um, is going to be carrying the recessive gene. So she passes it on. She doesn't exhibit the, the, the symptom, but she passes it on to her male offspring. Uh, it's on the, her X chromosome that she has given 
uh, and as she's placed in the egg cell. Uh, in AP2, we'll talk about you know, sperm cells can either be X or Y. Egg cells are always X. Uh, usually always X. Sometimes they can have more than one X. Sometimes they can have no Xs, but they're, the, the only option is to be, have an X chromosome. Now, the X chromosome, if it has this recessive gene, and, um, and that's in, in the egg, and the egg is fertilized, then the, the male offspring is fertilized with a, with a Y chromosome a sperm, then the male offspring will have this Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And so what will happen is that the, the uh, actins are not linked properly to the, to the cell membrane, and we start having issues with contractions of muscles, particularly in coordination, starts showing up around the age of two, somewhere between two and seven. You know, the, the thing is when kids are learning to walk at that age and, um, and, and manipulate their environment, it, it's hard to spot at first because, you know, kids are always clumsy because they're learning how to, to operate their bodies, but eventually, Somewhere between two and seven, if the, if the, if the male child continues to, to fall down all the time, when, you know, when, he, when you would expect uh, someone of his peer group not to be falling down, uh, that might be an indicator. What's happening is that the, the uh, cell membrane is being ripped and torn because there's not an adequate supply of dystrophin there. Uh, the cells are being destroyed. Uh, muscle cells lose their mass, um, the contractile fibers are destroyed, and eventually your um, individual with uh, muscular dystrophy dies around age, you know, generally around 30 years of age, usually from respiratory failure. And it's been a very uncomfortable life up to that point too. So uh, it is, uh, it, it, unfortunately it's passed on from the mother, uh, you don't usually know that the mother had the recessive trait until she's reproduced and has uh, delivered a, a male child that has, uh, has the condition. You know, uh, maternal, you know, the, this, this transfer uh, of sex-linked conditions is very common. Uh, male pattern baldness is a gift from uh, the mother, as is... Um, uh, what was another one? Oh, uh, red green color blindness. Male pattern baldness and red green color blindness. You know, minor conditions, but again, they are sex linked recessive traits passed on to male offspring uh, from uh, from the mother. This is a, this is a pretty significant one. This is going to severely significantly impact the, the life of the uh, of the male child here. So. Okay, other structures here in the sarcomere. Well, the entire cell um, uses these things called the sarcoplasmic, retic sarcoplasmic reticulum, very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum we talked about uh, that cells usually have. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a series of tubes that surround each myofibril and they, they run the length of the myofibril and they um, are packed with calcium. They form, they, they form a, 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 there's a bulge on them at the end of each sarcomere and, uh, in, the, and in between the, uh, the tubules of the uh, endoplasmic, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are a series of tubules called T tubules that run down from the surface of the cell membrane. And it, they look something like this. Okay, what you're looking at in this model, you can see this is a sarcomere there's, there is the light band, there's the I band, there's the dark A band right there. And so we have this structure called the Z line. The sarcomeres run from Z line to Z line. Now, if we look just below this and 
It's only because of the way the model's made. Uh, these, these light brown, these tan structures here are the sarcoposic reticulum and they're surrounding every myofibril. Now this is a myofibril. This is a myofibril. This is a myofibril. There's another one right there. And this is what we're looking at is just one big, this is one cell. Because up here, you can see the cell membrane is up here. And this is a nerve con uh, indirectly connecting to the muscle cell. Now, these uh, sarcoplasmic reticulums here are packed full of calcium. We need calcium for muscle contractions to take place. And the, uh, they line up with T-tubules. These, these blue structures here are tubes that extend from the, the, cell, the surface of the cell membrane to increase the surface area. When we get a nerve impulse, a stimulus from a motor nerve to say, we're gonna contract, the signal goes all the way down into every myofibril uh, through these T-tubules. Now on either these, the sarcoplasmic reticulum here is lined up on, they, they actually, they're actually lined up on the junction of the, um, between the A band and the I band. So you can see there's the A band, there's an I band there. There's another one over here. Now, these bulges we see here are, the, are what we call the cisterns. You know, we see it on each side here and here and here. And they're, they're all filled with calcium too. There's more calcium in the cisterns. And the T-tubule, when a signal comes down the T-tubule that we're gonna have to contract, the T-tubule can signal both sides of a sarcomere. It can signal on this side and this side on, on, on either side of it to open up the cisterns and flood the cell with calcium. Just hold that thought, that's, that's an important thing to remember about the calcium. So this is what the T-tubules look like. This is what the sarcoplasmic reticulum look, looks like. And of course we can see what a, uh, these are what the individual myo, these are the myofibrils. And you can see the, actually you can see the light and dark bands in this model. So every, um, okay. Every myofibril is surrounded. Every myofibril is surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, they contain a vast amount of calcium. Now the T-tubules, as I said, extend from the surface of the cell membrane and they are in contact with every sarcomere. They increase the surface area uh, so that a signal coming down a nerve signal that comes comes down the uh, cell membrane will be able to come and come in contact with every sarcomere. Uh, we call the structure a triad that's formed between the T tubule and a cistern on each side. Cistern just means a tank. That's all it means. It's a storage tank. Uh, it's like a well. And so the triad is the T tubule in the middle. And all it's going to do is allow a nerve impulse to come down and open up the, the, the cisterns. Okay. And here's the illustration of what I just showed you on the model. This is a myofibril. Here's one, here's one, here's one. There's the sarcoplasmic reticulum surrounding each myofibril. Um, and we see it again lined up uh, right on the edge of each, the juncture of the, the I band and the A band right there and right there. And there's the triad. There's the T tubule there coming down from the surface of the cell. Uh, over here's the cell membrane. And there's a cistern on each side of that. Okay, so, and this just says what I, what I already said. Nerve impulse comes down the T-tubule from the surface of the cell, goes and open and causes the cisterns at every sarcomere to open up and, and flood the cell with calcium. The calcium is critical here because calcium is actually is going to be what causes tropomyosin 
to yank, to pull the, the I'm sorry, the troponin, to pull the tropomyosin out of the way. Because remember, our actin binding sites are blocked. Tropomyosin is covering them. Troponin can move that, but only when calcium lands on it. So calcium is pretty important here for uh, muscle contractions. Now, a contraction occurs when the myosin heads form what's called a cross bridge with the actin. And what they will do is when they, when the binding sites are exposed, the myosin heads will actively reach up, bind to the actin and give it a yank. The myosin head has a power, it has, a, has, has the ability to pivot back and forth. It's powered by ATP. And what it will do is when the myosin head, when the actin is exposed, the myosin heads will automatically attach to the actin and then pivot towards the midline. And that will yank the actins towards the middle of the uh, sarcomere. That's contraction. That generates tension. That shortens the sarcomere, which shortens the, my, which since they're all doing it at the same time, every myofibril uh, is shortening at the same time and the entire muscle cell shortens at the same time. So we call this, this whole process, the sliding filament model of contraction. And the thin filaments are going to slide over top of the thick filaments when the myosin yanks on them. They don't change their length or their shape. They just slide over top of each other. The myosins never move. Only the myosin heads move. The myosins never move, but they pull the actins over top of them and the entire sarcomere shortens. And all the other billions of sarcomeres in that cell are shortening at the exact same time with the exact same force. It's an all or nothing. You either shorten or you don't. And if you get a nerve impulse, then you shorten. There's no, there's no discussion on it. There's no partial contraction. It's either all or nothing. So, so when we contract, what, we're, what we see happening here is the myosin heads will reach up, grab the actin, and will then pivot towards the midline of the sarcomere, meaning that they're going to yank towards the middle from you know, both sides are going to yank towards the middle. The actins slide over top. The actins are attached to the Z lines and that pulls the into and they're pulling the ends of the sarcomere in. Every sarcomere is doing that. So they're all shortening up. And everything gets tighter. Here's a sarcomere. There's a, it's totally relaxed sarcomere. You can see the Z lines over here on either end. There's dark bands running up and straight up and down. It even says Z uh, underneath it on the on the illustration on the uh, yeah on, on the illustration. The light band on either side of the Z line are the the actins. That's that's the I band. The A band is the dark band, which is mostly myosin. Now here we have it fully relaxed. When we get a when the myosins can when the myosin heads can reach up and grab onto the actin, they will pull the actin towards the middle of the sarcomere. It will come in from each side, and the sarcomere will shorten like this. So the Z lines have moved closer to the middle. <clears throat> the I bands uh, have gotten smaller. Uh, you can see that the actins now are over are over top completely over top of the uh, myosins. Let me go back and show you this. Notice where the actins and myosins overlap slightly here. When we contract, however, we've overlapped completely. The actins are being pulled towards the middle of the sarcomere on every sarcomere. The myosin heads are grabbing onto the actin and giving it a yank. Towards the, towards the midline. And then they're going to let go 
and they're going to do it again. And they're going to let go and do it again. As long as the binding sites are available, they're going to keep doing this. They're going to keep yanking on to um, the actin. At some point, they'll stop. They may run out of energy or the uh, calcium levels drop because calcium is what's keeping the, the binding sites open. Calcium binds to the troponin. It moves out of the way and drags the tropomyosin with it. And as long as the troponin's out of the way, we have binding sites. So it looks something like this. You can see how they're shortening. Cross bridge formation. It's what we call it where the myosins are, are, are attaching themselves to the actins and pulling the, the actin uh, proteins, the thin filaments over top of the thick filaments. So the entire sarcomere will shorten. So, and it slides over top of each other. That's why we call it the sliding filament model. Now, to get to this point requires some significant chemical activity in here chemical and electrical activity. Now the brain decides when we're gonna move our skeletal muscle. Our brain tells us what we're gonna do with skeletal muscle. It isn't an automatic thing like smooth muscle is and digesting, processing our food or the heart when the heart contracts. You know, we don't think about either one of those. This is the use of a motor nerve. And we have two sets of nerves in our bodies. We um, that feed into the spinal cord. We have sensory input. We talked about sensory input uh, in lab on Monday and Tuesday. We have sensory input and we have motor output. Motor nerves send motor signals out to skeletal muscle to do things. Now, we've been saying nerve impulse. The proper term, and the term you're gonna hear from now on, mostly, is action potential action potential. You see, our cells are all electrical. Our cells have a charge on them. If you were to stick a voltmeter into your skin, you'd be able to read a charge on the cells. Muscle cells have a charge of minus 90 millivolts. Nerve cells have a charge of minus 70 millivolts, but we are electrically charged. And we call this the membrane potential. I don't know, you know, I guess uh, you know, from physics or something about electrical activity, but that's what, you know, potential means it's uh, ability to, to, the ability to transfer electrical charges. So we have a membrane potential on all of our cells. And we can move, we can change that potential chemically. We can generate an action potential Whenever we change the member, the resting potential, because our, you know, if your cell's not doing anything right now, if your cell's at rest, you know, if I'm not using the muscle in my arm, that cell's at rest. It has a resting charge on it of around minus 90 millivolts. But if I get that muscle cell excited, I can change the charge on it from minus 90 all the way up to plus 30. And then it'll do something when it gets that stimulated. So we talk about action potentials as the ability to, to do some activity. Now, we do have one problem. Motor nerves from the brain do not connect directly to the muscle cells. They're not hardwired in. There's a gap between the muscle cell and the nerve. Now, every muscle cell is in, is, is in indirect contact with a nerve, with a motor nerve, but there is a gap between the muscle cell and the nerve. So we have to use what's known as a neurotransmitter, a chemical that allows us to take the action potential from the motor nerve and start it up again in the muscle cell itself. So we use it, 
We use this chemical called a neurotransmitter and the most well-known neurotransmitter, and one you're gonna hear more and more about, more than you ever wanted to know, is uh, acetylcholine. So, okay, I've probably gotten a little too excited on all that. Cells have charges. Every cell in our bodies has a charge. Uh, muscle cells are charged uh, at minus 90 millivolts. Nerves are minus 70 millivolts. The reason we have the charge is based on the ions that are outside the cell and inside the cell. Now, most cells have lots, have high levels of sodium outside, uh, outside the cell. In the interstitial fluid surrounding all of our cells in our bodies, our high levels of sodium. Remember, sodium is a, a component of our plasma. You know, we are, our, our plasma is 0.9% sodium chloride. So we always have high levels of sodium on the outside of our cells. <coughs> sodium is a positively charged ion. We always write sodium as Na+. Plus. The, um, so the outside of our cells are positive. The inside of our cells are considered negative, just like a battery. Batteries have a positive end and a negative end. And our cells have a positive side and a negative side. Now, what's inside the cell is usually potassium. The most common ion inside all of our cells is potassium. But potassium is also a positively charged ion. It's you know, K plus, you see, you know, you know, because it is, it has given up an electron, it's positively charged. However, we have much less potassium ions inside the cell than sodium ions outside. So despite the fact that the inside of the cell has positive ions, the inside of the cell is considered negative because there's, more, there's many more positive ions outside than there are inside. So we say the inside of the cell is negative with respect to the outside. Don't get confused in that. Just remember that the outside of the cell is positive and the inside is considered negative. Now, that difference in charge, the overwhelmingly uh, powerful positive charge on the outside and the uh, less positive charge on the inside makes it the inside negative. So we now have a difference. We have a difference in charges, positive outside, negative inside, just like a battery. That generates a charge on the cell. We call it the resting potential because there's a difference in the charges. Now, sodium and potassium don't get along well. And sodium is always trying to leak into the cell. Uh, sodium finds any way it can to leak into the cell. It's, it's what it does, it's simple diffusion. Uh, there's vast quantities of sodium outside the cell, and there's less sodium inside. So sodium is always leaking in. And there are higher levels of potassium inside the cell than outside. So potassium is always leaking out. And we use the sodium potassium pump to try and correct that. Because we want to keep high levels of sodium outside and low levels of potassium inside. So, but here's, there's the problem. Sodium is always coming in, potassium is always going out. So we use the sodium potassium pump to keep sodium outside and to keep potassium inside. We're always pumping sodiums out and bringing potassiums back in. Now they're leaking out, but we're pumping them out faster than they're leaking in. And they're, they're leaking out, but we're bringing them back in faster than they're leaking out. So we keep high levels of sodium outside the cell and uh, high levels of potassium inside the cell. Even though they're both positive ions, the inside of the cell is considered to be negative because there are much less positive charges inside than outside because we're busy pumping, pumping the sodiums out. 
This difference in the charges is what we call the membrane potential, minus 90 millivolts. We say that the cell membrane is polarized. We say batteries are polarized, so they have a positive and a negative end. We say that the cell is polarized because the outside is positive and the inside is negative. So it's a polarized structure. And that's just, that's fine. That's what we want. Now, another thing to remember, and you're, all, you're asking, well, what's this got to do with muscle contractions? Just stay with me. The um, cell membrane has ion channels. We, we know this. We've talked about simple diffusion and the, how the, the carrier proteins and the channel proteins allow uh, ions and water and glucose and things like that to move across the membrane. But now we're going to look at ion channels that have gates on them. There's, they're very unique structures. They open, these gates open and close. The gates are specific for certain ions. Now there's two terms here. We have what's known as the ligand gate, which is a chemical gate. A chemical is used as a key to unlock the gate. So we use what's known as that neurotransmitter, a special chemical that will fit the gate, unlock it, and allow it to open up. And it's only for sodium, or it's only for potassium. Sometimes it's for both, but usually there's, there, you know, uh, a neurotransmitter, one will work for sodium, one will work for potassium, one will work for calcium they're all going to be different. These are the chemical gates. They will not open unless the right neurotransmitter lands there. The other type of gate is the electrical gate, the voltage gate. This opens when there's a change in the charge on the membrane. They'll also close when there's a change in the charge in the membrane. So some of the gates open up when the membrane uh, the, the charge in the membrane goes from minus 90 to minus 50. And some will close as the charge goes to plus 30. And others open up. So these voltage gates are very selective. They only open when the right charge is present. Sort of like a garage door opener. Um, so we open, up, we open up the gate when the right charge is there. We close the gate when the right charge is there. So we have ligand gates or chemical gates, and we have voltage gates. And these are specific for sodium and potassium. So we have, we, you know, despite all these gates, we're still gonna have channels that leak all the time. Sodium is all, remember, sodium is always leaking into the cell. That's what it does, because there's always high levels of sodium outside the cell, and we're always busy pumping it back out. But there are gates that are going to be either voltage gates or chemical gates that will open to allow sodium to come in the cell. And that's different from a gate that's open all the time. The voltage gates, the chemical gates are only open at certain, when, when the right key is put in the lock or when the right voltage occurs. So we have voltage gates and chemical gates in addition to the leaking, the regular open channels, we're going to have a whole lot more voltage gates and a whole lot more chemical gates than we do from the normal leakage. Here's one for potassium. This is a voltage gate for potassium. The gate is normally closed, but when the gate opens up, when the right charge on the membrane occurs, when we turn on the power, turn on the electrical power in the cell, then the gate opens up and potassium can leave the cell. So this is a, this is a voltage gate. Now the ligand gates are different. They have to have a neurotransmitter. Now, well, later on, we'll, we'll talk about how many hundreds of different neurotransmitters there are. And uh, the number one neurotransmitter we talk about the most is, uh, acetylcholine. It, uh, it's, you know, you'll hear a, a lot more about that from here on out about acetylcholine. Anyway, the neurotransmitter lands on the gate. 
you know, it unlocks the gate so that uh, in this case, potassium can leave the cell or go into the cell. The neurotransmitter, whatever it is, lands on the gate so it'll, it'll, it'll function. If it's the wrong neurotransmitter, nothing happens. So there comes our neurotransmitter taking its good old time and it lands there and the gate slowly opens and there goes the potassium. So, okay. Yeah. So we know we have gates. We know we have neurotransmitters. Uh, the gates are gonna be chemical gates or voltage gates in our cell membranes. So let's get back to how the muscle actually contracts. First thing that has to occur is our brain has to send a signal to a muscle. We have to consciously decide to pick something up or put it back down. Okay, so that's the nerve stimulation. The nerve stimulation, the nerve impulse coming from the brain is also an action potential. That's really what it's called is an action potential. And the action potential goes all the way to the end of the motor nerve. And then it releases its neurotransmitter, which allows a new action potential to start in the muscle cell. So we have to create, we have to take the action potential from the nerve and use that to create a new action potential in the muscle cell. I don't know why we have this gap. We have a, we have a, a slight delay there. Maybe it's to allow the muscle cell to be ready. Maybe it's so when we have a second and third and fourth and fifth action potential, the cells are always ready to uh, contract again and again and again, whatever. But we have a gap. Yeah. The gap functions as a time delay for us to slow, slow the process down. Now, we don't notice it. This time delay is not anything that we're aware of because it's in milliseconds and to us it's instantaneous. I mean, I don't have to say, okay, I want to pick up my pencil. There we go, I can do it now. It doesn't work that way. So we generate an action potential in the cell membrane. We send the signal all the way across the cell membrane and down the T-tubules. And then we can release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now these first two things that take place, the, the, the nerve stimulation from the muscle, from the, from the brain, and the generation of an action potential in the muscle cell take place at a, at a structure known as the neuromuscular junction. It's where the nerve and the muscle indirectly come together. Now the action potential being propagated across the cell membrane and the rise of calcium are gonna take place inside the, the muscle cell. And we call that excitation contraction coupling. There could have been a better way to say that, but that's what we call it. So the neuromuscular junction, every muscle cell is in contact with a nerve. Nerves have nerve endings. They're called axon terminals. The, the end of a nerve, the nerve extension that sends signals out is called the axon. So we have our, our motor nerve running down from the brain. And as it gets down to the muscle cells, it branches out into, into endings called terminals. It can have up to 300 axon terminals. Each axon terminal will have indirect contact with a muscle cell. So each muscle cell in every muscle is, is under the control of a motor nerve. It may be 300 muscle cells responding to one uh, nerve. It may be a half a dozen muscle cells responding to a nerve. So, but every axon will divide as it gets to the muscle and every connection is called the neuromuscular junction. So we have the axon terminal resting just above the muscle itself. We call it the neuromuscular junction. Now on the muscle cell, the surface of the muscle cell, we have a structure known as the motor end plate. And that's a specific area. See the, the axon, the axon terminal isn't gonna just randomly find a spot to land on the muscle cell. 
it has a very specific location called the motor end plate because that's where the action potential is going to get propagated. The axon terminal, it's the end of the axon. The, um, there's a gap called the synaptic cleft because this is a synapse. And within the axon terminal are vesicles, contain, little bubbles containing acetylcholine. And on the motor end plate, are going to be acetylcholine receptor sites. So it looks something like this. Here we see the axon of the motor nerve coming down here. Here, it, this bulge is the axon terminal right here. And these little round things are vesicles, bubbles containing acetylcholine. This is the synaptic cleft. This is the gap between the axon terminal and the muscle cell. It's just filled with interstitial fluid in here. And this is the motor end plate down here. The motor end plate is folded to increase the surface area. And there are lots and lots of acetylcholine receptor sites on the motor end plate and they control sodium gates. So when acetylcholine lands on the motor end plate, it will open up a whole bunch of sodium gates and allow the sodium that's in the interstitial fluid to flood the inside of the cell and not just dribbling in like it does through simple diffusion, but this will be a massive inrush of sodium at, at the motor end plate. We also, just to sort of throw this in here, these little purple things up here, those are calcium gates. These uh, acetylcholine can't uh, form inside the vesicles um, and migrate to the uh, cell membrane of the axon terminal like it's doing there to release the acetylcholine unless calcium enters the cell through the calcium gate. Calcium gate is an electrical gate. So we're seeing two different types of gates right here. So let's see, yeah. So what happens? The action potential comes down to the axon terminal. The, the calcium gates open up. Calcium causes the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across to the uh, sodium gates on, on the motor end plate that are controlled by their that they need acetylcholine to unlock them. Acetylcholine lands on those gates. The, the sodium gates open up and sodium floods into the motor end plate. And then the acetylcholine is broken down by an enzyme called a cholinesterase. So let's see. Now, let me go back here. This is what an axon terminal looks like it's sort of a bulge like this. Let me show. This is our axon terminal right here. We see this is the axon here, the action potential from the, uh, yes, thank you. The action potential from the, the brain is gonna come down here um, and into the axon terminal. There may be 300 axon terminals on uh, one, uh, on one nerve. These little white things are the um, vesicles containing acetylcholine. These locations here and over here are the calcium channels. When the charge, when, when the action potential, which is a charge comes down the membrane here, it opens up these calcium channels Calcium floods in, there's always calcium in the interstitial fluid. Calcium floods in and allows these vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane of the axon terminal right here. And the acetylcholine then goes out into the synaptic cleft and finds their way over to the receptor sites on the motor end plate. Problems. There is a problem occasionally 
with acetylcholine. There is a, a, an autoimmune condition known as myasthenia gravis that occurs when uh, there is not enough receptor sites for acetylcholine to land on. Myasthenia gravis, uh, our immune system destroys the uh, uh, acetylcholine receptor sites on the muscle cells uh, around the eyelids, uh, uh, in uh, the muscles in, in the throat, that are involved with swallowing and with talking, and also systemic muscle action. So these, these um, uh, skeletal muscle cells that would normally have receptor sites for acetylcholine, the, the receptor sites are being destroyed. And so your, you know, your patient can't do things. Uh, it's particularly noticeable with, they have a, what's known as a drooping eyelid. It, it sounds simple, but it really is pretty significant here because the, uh, the, the muscle cells that control the eyelid, uh, the receptor sites are destroyed. So one of the eyelids will droop down. You see how it is on, on the uh, left eye. The right eye is not affected. Uh, we also see this yeah, may cause a lot of difficulty in talking uh, or swallowing or eating. So uh, it's caused by, you know, not because of lack of acetylcholine, but because the receptor sites are being destroyed. Now, what will happen then is, well, you release the acetylcholine, uh, it goes over where it's supposed to go, but there's no receptor sites. And then your body's response is, well, okay, we released the acetylcholine, now we've got to destroy it. We use the uh, cholinesterase that our body makes, the enzyme which destroys the acetylcholine. Nothing happens then because you don't you don't get a contraction, you simply release the acetylcholine and then you destroy it. So the treatment for this is to interfere with the breakdown of the acetylcholine. There are medications that contain an, a cholinesterase inhibitor, which you know, cholinesterase is the enzyme which breaks down acetylcholine, let's interfere with that enzyme. It leaves the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft longer so it has more time to find the few remaining receptor sites. This is not an unusual uh, response uh, treatment. Ma there are many types of, of uh, uh, drugs that we use to treat uh, depression so that we can keep the ne a neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft longer. So we'll talk more about that when we get into the nervous system. Okay. So this is what okay, we can watch this. This is, this is actually pretty good. Hopefully it's not too loud. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called a neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step one, an action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step two, voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step three, Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step four, acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors, which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step five, these ligand-gated cation channels open. Step six, sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber 
and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step seven. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. One, acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. Two, acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. Okay, so that gets us all the way to the breakdown of the acetylcholine. The reason we want to get rid of it is so we can send a second signal down. We can't get a second stimulus if acetylcholine is still in the synaptic cleft. So, still doesn't explain how we're going to get a contraction yet. So when we want to generate, get a contraction going, we have we don't think about this. But this is what's going on. The cell membrane is charged. It's polarized. It is positive on the outside and negative on the inside. On this is on the muscle cell, uh, and actually on the, on the motor nerve too. The action potential uh, travels down the motor nerve, causes a release of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft uh, is, you know, sort of like a, you know, filled with, with sort of a jelly-like fluid, uh, and the acetylcholine drifts across there, and it lands on the receptor sites on the sodium gates and causes those gates to open up. Now, what we're going to see is we're going to change the charge on the end plate. The end plate right now is sitting there at minus 90 millivolts based on Sodium outside, potassium inside. What happens if all this massive amount of sodium decides to suddenly come in and drag all their positive charges with it? It's going to change the charge at the motor end plate. And that's going to lead to two more events called depolarization and repolarization. So we've got to get the, the uh, motor end plate excited. We have to have enough sodium to come in at the motor end plate to change the charge there. And we have to hit what's known as a threshold value. Doesn't matter if we get, get some sodium coming in. We didn't release very much neurotransmitter like the myasthenia gravis uh, individual. If he didn't get enough or she didn't get enough uh, neurotransmitter released, where there were enough receptor sites and only a little bit of sodium is gonna come in at, at the motor end plate. You got to have enough sodium come in to actively change the charge on the membrane. Right now, the membrane is at minus 90 millivolts. So sodium comes, sodium, the sodium gates open up when acetylcholine lands on them. And then the sodium will go in those gates in, at the motor end plate into the inside of the muscle cell. And they're going to be changing the charge because you're going to be adding, uh, you're going to be increasing the number of positive charges. Remember, the inside of the muscle cell is negative with respect to the outside. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of positive sodiums coming in. And the change in the charge starts, the charge in the membrane starts rising. And it starts, yeah, rising from minus 90 to minus 80 to minus 70 to minus 60. And if we hit, minus 50 millivolts, we've hit what's known as the threshold value. The threshold level, the charge, if the, thresh, if the motor end plate hits minus 50 millivolts, it will open up voltage gates on either side of the motor end plate. 
And that's what we're trying to, to see happen here. So we got to hit threshold. If we hit threshold, the voltage gates on either side of the motor end plate will open up and an even greater amount of sodium will come in. All we've done so far uh, with the motor end plate is cause a local, what we call, what we say is a localized depolarization event. We change the charge to motor end plate, but if we don't hit threshold, nothing else will, will happen. We don't have an action potential forming. We, if, if, all we've gotten is a localized depolarization because we're, you know, we say it's depolarized because we're changing the charge on the membrane from positive to sort of negative. You know, the outside was positive and the inside was negative and we're sending so much sodium to the inside of the cell membrane at the motor end plate that it's becoming positive on the inside and less positive outside or, or negative on the outside. That changes the charge. If we hit threshold, then voltage gates on either side of the motor end plate are going to open up and even more sodium is going to run in. Once we hit threshold, we have an action potential and nothing will stop that action potential. It will run now across the cell membrane, depolarizing each region it comes to and causing it to hit threshold and causing more sodium to rush in until it has gone through the entire muscle cell. So what will happen here is as soon as we hit threshold, there are what we call fast sodium gates that open up. That's what those red gates are. We hit minus 50 millivolts and sodium rushes in and we keep changing the charge on the membrane from minus 50 to minus 40 to minus 30 to minus 20 to zero, plus 10, plus 20. When we get up to plus 30 millivolts, when we change the charge of the membrane from minus 90 to plus 30, the sodium gates shut and the potassium gates open. The potassium gates open at plus 30 millivolts. And now sodium, we, we've got all the sodium coming into the cell that we can handle. Now we start sending potassium out. We start pumping potassium out at plus 30 millivolts. And that's repolarizing the charge. We're going to send so much potassium out that we reestablish the resting potential of minus 90 millivolts. It doesn't matter. We have sodium and potassium in the wrong places. What we're looking at are the number of charges. So the inside of the cell is positive. So let's re correct that. Let's send all these positive charges out and reestablish the charge on the membrane. So. So here's what's happening. The nerve on, on, in number one here, the nerve impulse comes down the axon terminal, down to the axon terminal. Calcium uh, floods in here because there's an electrical charge on the act. The act there's an action potential on the axon terminal. Calcium floods in, allows acetylcholine to be released into the synaptic cleft, which opens up the sodium gates at the motor end plate only. Enough acetylcholine opens up enough sodium gates so that we depolarize, we change the charge on the membrane at the motor end plate sufficiently to where it goes from minus 90 millivolts to minus 50 millivolts. That's threshold. When we hit threshold, sodium, sodium gates on either side of the motor end plate that are voltage gates will open up at minus 50. They start opening up. They allow sodium to rush into the rest of the, of the cell membrane, into the cytoplasm of, of the muscle cell. Sodium rushes in. It, it changes the charge here. When it changes the charge, then it causes the charge, the charge is changing from threshold minus 50, it goes all the way up to plus 30. Sodium gates shut at plus 30 and potassium gates open. We have an action potential that's running down across the membrane. As we depolarize, we depolarize each region that we come to. Sodium comes in, we uh, change the charge, potassium goes out, we change the charge. Sodium continues to come in 
as we see the electrical charge changing. The more sodium that comes in, the area adjacent to that, you know, you see where the, in number two, you see where the, the purple, uh, the, the, the pink sodium channel is open, sodium's rushing in. We are depolarizing the area adjacent to that, and that will cause the next sodium channel to open up, and the next sodium channel to open up, and the next sodium channel to open up. But since we don't want to stay depolarized, as we continue to change the charge, we eventually open up the potassium channels, pump the potassium out, and reestablish the charge. And this runs all the way across the membrane and down in through the T-tubules. I think I just said all this. So the end plate potential, this is what's happening at the motor end plate. We have a localized depolarization. When the sodium channels at the motor end plate open up from the acetylcholine, Sodium rushes in. Sodium rushes in and has a localized effect at the motor end plate only. They will, we will have a localized depolarization. There's a change in the charge in the membrane. The membrane at the motor end plate was minus 90. Now we're rapidly heading towards minus 50. If we don't get to minus 50, nothing happens. If we get to minus 50, we've hit threshold. Now we're going to have an action, an action potential now forms that will run until it's done. So depolarization spreads all the way across the, the entire muscle cell down into all the T-tubules and it's unstoppable. Once it starts, you can't stop it. As you open, as you depolarize a region, as, as you come to each voltage gate for sodium, and you hit threshold there, it opens up and more sodium comes in and that sodium changes the charge and as that, that charge change approaches the next sodium gate, it opens up and it continues all the way across the cell membrane. And then once you, but you don't just stop at minus 50, you keep going. And every time you get to plus 30, that, that closes the sodium gate and opens up the potassium gate. So as fast as we're depolarizing, a region with the action potential, we start the repolarization right behind it. Repolarization occurs when the sodium gate shut and the potassium gates open. We start sending potassium out into this into the interstitial spaces, and we end up reversing the charge back to minus 90. Even though it's potassium on the outside and sodium on the inside, now just the opposite of what we had. It doesn't matter. It's changing the charge back to normal is what's important. We get back down to minus 90 and then the sodium potassium pump kicks in and reestablishes the concentrations practically instantly. So depolarization depends on how much sodium comes in initially from how much acetylcholine gets released. If there's not enough acetylcholine, if there's not enough acetylcholine receptor sites, we may not hit threshold. And if we didn't hit threshold, then nothing's going to happen. And we're not going to be aware of it. We're not going to be aware of it. We're not going to be able to perceive the fact that we've started a contraction of a muscle in our arm, for example. So. Now to, under, to go over this again, because you're gonna hear about depolarization and repolarization for uh, the rest of the semester. Depolarization occurs when sodium goes into a cell. When, it, when sodium rushes in, we change the charge from minus 90 in muscle cells all the way up to plus 30. That's depolarization. Repolarization occurs when we hit plus, when we go all the way up to plus 30, when we hit plus 30, the sodium stops coming in and potassium starts going out. Once we start, it will run all the way down. We will, we will always go to plus 30 millivolts, but that shuts down the, the, remember these are sodium voltage channels that opened up. 
these sodium voltage channels opened up at minus 50, they'd close at plus 30. The potassium channels open at plus 30 and close again at minus 90. So we, are, we can repolarize the cell back to where it was before. So it can do it again. So it can have a second action potential and a third action potential. It takes no time at all to depolarize and repolarize ready for the second contraction. So. So how much time are we talking about? Well, from depolarization to repolarization uh, takes somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven milliseconds. We can't process, that's, that's um, seven thousandths of a second. We can't process something that happens that rapidly. So we, you can see we, we open up our sodium channels, um, here at about uh, three or four milliseconds, maybe two milliseconds into the process at minus 90. Once we get up to, to uh, threshold, then we're off and running. We go all the way up to plus 30, the sodium channels close, potassium channels open, we repolarize and you know we're repolarized at 10 milliseconds altogether. The actual time we spent in depolarizing and repolarizing was somewhere between six and seven seconds, which is pretty fast. And so, and we're back to where we were before by 10 seconds into the whole process, 10 milliseconds into the whole process. That's 10 thousandths of one second, which we just can't comprehend. So, so to summarize, the resting potential on a muscle cell is minus 90 millivolts. Threshold is 50 millivolts. Depolarization occurs from minus 90 up to plus 30 when the sodium channels are active. Repolarization shuts the sodium channels and opens the potassium channels and we go from plus 30 back down to minus 90. So this is everything I've been talking about for the past 20 minutes is here in one slide. Sodium goes in, we, uh, and we depolarize the cell up to plus 30. At plus 30, the sodium gates shut, and the potassium starts going out on the open gates. And this will bring us back, by sending the potassium out, this will bring us back down to minus 90. And we're ready to do the whole thing again. And do it again. Because when, you know, when we contract a muscle, we don't just fire the nerve one time to contract one muscle cell one time. We contract that cell again and again and again. So it, it isn't something that happens once and done. We, will, we have to have the muscle cell ready to go again and again and again. So, okay, let me stop because uh, I don't have enough time to really get into this. So we will pick up with this on Monday. Uh, we stopped here and anybody have any questions on anything? Okay, then I'm going to get us out of here and I will see everybody Monday.